lighting fares in snow. Tread out a marble hollow, then lay the twigs athwart, teepee-wise or wigwam, so that the air can follow the match flame from the start, as we begin a poem, and some may win a heart. For twig to twig will beckon, if lightly laid above, better than you can reckon. Waste no time devising. No, no, it is not love, but the drying fume arising, if the draught be free enough. As the under cavern reddens, leave well alone. Cold fuel only deadens, but pile across the smoke and give the dog a bone. For its life's sake, don't poke. The wise power knows its own. The wise poem knows its father and treats him not amiss. But language is its mother to burn where it would rather choose that and bypass this, only afraid of smother, though the thickening snowflakes hiss. The Solitary Daffodil From committee doodle day, beckoned by the cocktail roar, feeling for what seemed a way, I groped, as I had groped before. A vivid presence in the grass held me up, I could not pass. A solitary daffodil. Its candid countenance was there, speaking of the end of ill, with mild, confiding, tranquil air. Its crisp, translucent walls, so pure, I grew as sure as it was sure. Through golden depths, on, on it spoke, a little trumpet, grave and deep, and nodded lightly as it woke the world from transcendental sleep. Alone had it been waiting there, a herald and a harbinger. So, as a lost word found can say, the never so well known before, it welcomed me into a day, and almost opened me a door through which I may still step to be in recollected company. Forfeits. Here is a thing, and a very pretty thing. What shall I do with this very pretty thing? What have I in my hand? Staff of command? Ho, ho, field marshal, let, let call this collie shangy off before worse harm. Let me retreat. To dodge defeat today, the only way is only to disarm. Here is a thing, and a very pretty thing. What shall I do with this very pretty thing? What have I in my hand? A baton to conduct what I select? Our Kapellmeister set our wishes in array, duly in line, and then let them intone their own fine requiem. Here is a thing, and a very pretty thing. What shall I do with this very pretty thing. Still in my hand, how lay this ghost, or charm, or sign, a pretty thing to cling, this roll, this post, unknown, unconned. Lay down, lay down, old clown, lay down, that country. But still, desire and will. Legs be still. Far enough you've walked, under, up and across, hill over hill. What, are you twitching still? Heart be still. Times enough you have balked, battened on mortal dross, 
gobbled your fill. What are you hungry still? Tongue, be still. Long enough you have talked, laying out gain and loss, wish beside will. Would you prophesy still? Mind, be still. To be. Still missing it, though. Though what? None know. Still journeying on. On what commission? Still hoping to be there. Ere we be anywhere. And waiting till an hour. Our idleness empower. For place and hour and we, we seek at best to be. Being a want, all three, and indiscernibly. Harvard Yard in April. April in Harvard Yard. To and fro across the fretted snow, figures, footprints, shadows go. Their python boughs a sway. The fountain elms cascade in swinging lattices of shade. Where this or that or the other thought might perch and rest, and rest they ought for poise or reach. Not all is timely. See, the beach in frosty elephantine skin, still winter sealed, will not begin. Though silt the alleys are on our debris of the fallen flower and other flowery allure, lounge sunlit on the steps and there degrees of loneliness confer. Lest, lest, away, you may be lost by May. To dumb forgetfulness. Forget, forget, forget what you forget. The diary entry, name, fact, place and date, let go and let the loitering dead be dead. Missed cue, lost quote, worst muddle figures yet, the choice statistic much mislaid of late. Forget, forget, forget what you forget. The sidelong glance, the sigh, the oblique head, the lifeless tone you could anticipate, let go and let the loitering dead be dead. The hidden face, the word too gently said, that spelled may be a formula of fate. Forget, forget, forget what you forget. Why should they haunt you, hold you in their debt, remind you of their loss? The debt is paid. Let go and let the loitering dead be dead. All feeling now like foliage to be shed. Did you forget? Regret as well must fade. Let go and let the loitering dead be dead. Forget, forget, forget what you forget. Here are selections from The Screens and Other Poems, 1960. The first poem is Birthday Thoughts. Section 4. Surely this day may beg forbearance, both of and for forebears and descendants. Summon, I dare, heirs and legators, each day but two, both loath mediators. Forbear days, you through whom I'm here, handing along our powers and our fear. How may a moment in motley dress hint, when forgot, what might be best? Predecessors, take heed, 
need no more be dead than successors succeed. Seed ill sped. Most children don't now bow much to parents. Most famous men end up as defendants. Pledging the future, your careless abandon squandered the wherewithal all could now stand on. Wide off the beam, dream confounded, seeing no more than I, why we weren't grounded. You ruined me betimes, much, much as I, I in my turn, burn what they'd lived by. Must such be the fashion, passion gone sour, what the movement decrees, lees of our hour. Would that altogether, whether this needs be, we might consider iteratively. Since on a birthday may a new day start, and old lag lapse, perhaps, revenant depart. Reflections. Section 2, whose title is Content. Poetry lifts the veil from the hidden beauty of the world and makes familiar objects be as if they were not familiar. It reproduces all that it represents, and the impersonations clothed in its Elysian light stand thenceforward in the minds of those who have once contemplated them as memorials of that gentle and exalted content which extends itself over all thoughts and actions with which it coexists. Shelley, from The Defence of Poetry. Content, content, let be what will, as content, this strange stage fulfil, aiding its forms to represent what may not otherwise be meant. Let be the scene that veil may hide of paradise or parricide. Calm the supernal light let shine, clothing the wreck of the design. Under its spare admonishment, we decorate our discontent as a perpetual monument with better than a coat of paint. Seafaring. And it has a first section called Comb and Glass and the quotation from Petrarch on Mont Bantou. The life we call blessed is located on a high peak. A narrow way, they say, leads up to it. Many hills intervene, and we must proceed from virtue to virtue with exalted steps. Uphill all the way, it read, but going downhill fast these days, yes, running down, they said. Close up, tangles of tasks in hand. Far off, a hesitating figure on the sand. Those billows, all that main, for Wordsworth house a sense sublime. For Blake, this tumbling life again, the sea of space and time. Though inland far we be, yet equally we're all at sea. Newton's strange seas of thought, by routine traffic jammed, their lanes queue full, their waves taut dry, their current cargoes damned. Who'll now the murex find within what reach of mind? The mind, that ocean, sound. Your psychobathysphere waits, panting like a hound. Its intake sampling gear will fish up what is found in the drowning by the drowned. Or from behaviours, neat correlation curves, expect new light to win. Of 
fumble at the doors, an inner eye observes, open only from within. That eye, we may forget, can wake in anyone. Who'd sail beyond the sunset must overleap the sun. Make ready for the foolish flight in Glaucon's laugh begun. All set at last to win, till three times round spin our gallant ship, and three times round spin we, and dizzying down that loftiest land, close over us the sea. The next poem is Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal. Nature is better dressed than man. These various birds and fish, even the gator on his bank, can make one wish we people weren't so rank. And most, the humbled one, self-fluent, living stream upon his belly in the dust. None of all seem in better taste. His suiting, modest, rich, subdued, choice custom drape, in stripe and weave correct, shrewd for a shape so bitterly abject. He who originally rolled erect, uplifted high his burnished neck of verdant gold, crested aloft. An eye observant, through which the sight of Eve at work, stooping amid her flowery plait, converting Satan, could irk evil itself, the plot forgot, stupidly good. He whom the tempter found, fearless and feared he slept. Why should he watch unwarned? and within him crept, seized and suborned. Bear serpent, never a fool, nor nocent yet, a friend to all, how should he know? Tool only, and punished so. See now, the fly, the brim, bass, cormorant, gar, and gator ravening. Was this all through him? And later, bikinis too. The yearling swift, and it has this epigraph. Although the yearling swifts do not breed, they frequent the colonies during the breeding season, selecting holes, forming pairs, and even building nests. From The Home Life of the Swift, by David and Elizabeth Lack in 20th Century Bestiary, a Scientific American book, Simon and Schuster. Bygones begone, they trouble me, echoings from what used to be. Study instead to soothe the mind these ultra denizens of the wind, scarce here than past, sped flashing by on after images in the eye. Before these birds were got or laid, parents in Africa fed and played, skimming the water's film for drink, climbing higher than you can think, screaming up sparrows leading to, winging a night-long cycle through, falling as dawn comes wheeling by to snatch a gnat or early fly, weaving up north, swung north the sun, back to the home site, fought for one, waiting about till, flap, who's here? The fellow you went with yesteryear. Building anew the nest you built, all out of airborne drift and silt. Anything carried by gust or flaw, petal or feather or leaf or straw, gumming them, wall and roof and floor, leaving a drop hole for your door. Then, ah, then at the sacred hour, Poised between dearth and hour, balanced between night and day, out on a brilliant wing of May. 
8 p.m. or 6 a.m., then the aerial requiem, gliding down the cushioning air, scream together the mating pair. Two or three eggs, what toil and pain, chill England hung with mist and rain, hardly an insect on the wing, five hours of swooping, but to bring one bolus back to a gaping bill, until one day when you've caught your fill, what you've been feeding and fending for has quietly tipped through your drop hole door, spread out its wings unspread before, opened its lifetime in the air, beats it maybe to Africa. Didn't you once from a nest so steal? Better gulp down that needless meal. See now the yearlings home again, African flights enjoyed in vain, colony circling far and near. What is it now they play at here? Outcomes come out, they baffle me, samplings of what needs must be.